I'll go ahead and, and uh, turn it over to Amy Reap. Uh, Amy's the operations manager at the Wichita Allen House. All right, thanks, Sam. We want to thank you and the Newton Public Library for asking us to be part of this. Um, I know some of you have been to the Allen House, been on tours, special events. We thank you for that support. Um, a lot of you are familiar with Corbin Education Center, Century Two, uh, but we have a lot of other buildings in Wichita that were influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and so that's kind of what we're gonna touch on tonight. So we hope you learned something new about the influence he had in Wichita and the span of these buildings um, throughout our city. So tonight the presentation is actually gonna be delivered by Sonia Vaught. She is one of our experienced docents here at the Allen House. She's been um, leading tours, doing presentations since 2016. So I will turn it over to Sonia and I hope everybody enjoys this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to make sure that my screen is being shared. Do you still see it, Sam? Um, it was there a second ago. You, you probably need to start sharing it again. Okay. Okay, there we go. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Newton Public Library for um, allowing us to come and present. And I appreciate everyone who has taken the time to tune in as well, because um, I really enjoy talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and I've done a lot of additional research that's been a lot of fun. So I'm anxious to share that with everyone. So here's a few buildings here in Wichita. You're familiar with maybe the two buildings that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, designed in Wichita, and that is the Wichita Allen House, um, and then the Corbin Education Center. But Frank Lloyd Wright's ex his influence definitely extended beyond those two buildings. And you see some examples here. We're gonna start by talking about the Allen House specifically, and then I will turn and show you how his influence then went from those times, starting in 1918 with Allen House, and eventually 1964 when Corbin Education Center was completed, and how his influence then came back to town. So 1918 is our first appearance of Frank Lloyd Wright in Wichita, as far as we know, and the Allen House was designed at that time. Uh, I'm sorry, it was designed in 1915, yeah. That's when the house was commissioned. It was completed in 1918. And this is a uh, period picture of the house. It's one that I always really like because it shows that it was a new neighborhood. And that's exactly what was going on at that time. Uh, College Hill was a brand new neighborhood being um, peopled by more of the affluent people of, of Wichita. Frank Lloyd Wright was actually born in 1867. Um, he died in 1959 at the age of nearly 92, and so his career spanned 70 years. Um, he was extremely prolific. He designed over a thousand buildings and homes. Over 500 of those were actually realized, and over 400 still exist today. Um, it, there, it is said that he was more prolific in the last 20 years than he was at any other time in his career. And so that's why this influence in the later part of his lifetime and just beyond really extends to Wichita. This is Henry J. Allen and his wife, Elsie Allen. And they were the ones who commissioned the Allen House to be built by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, they came to Wichita in 1906 and they came here when Mr. Allen bought the Wichita Beacon. And so they lived in an affluent part of the city at that time. The problem was that Wichita, as most of the natives who are watching know, is at the confluence of two rivers. And so there were many historic <laughs> floods going on at that time. Um, in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, 
up until the 1940s when they began to talk about a project that would eventually divert the water around Wichita. But in the early 1900s, it was still an issue. And so the Allens were looking for a place to build that was higher ground. And we talk about College Hill as if it's in a neighborhood, and, and it is, people live in College Hill. But in those days, the way they referred to it was living on College Hill. And so there is uh, correspondence going back and forth between Mr. and Mrs. Allen during that time frame where he's constantly asking her, how is our house on College Hill coming along? So, um, you know, College Hill is the highest part of Wichita. It's the biggest hill we're gonna get over here. And so this is the home that was realized. Um, this is a prairie style home. And it's one of Frank Lloyd Wright's last prairie style home. In fact, it's the last prairie style home that has all of the, um, the elements of a prairie style. And those elements are gonna include long horizontality. And that's really easy to see about this house when you look at it from either the front, which is, this is a view of the front of the house, or from the side. And Frank Lloyd Wright does a few things to um, emphasize that horizontality. You see the material at the top and the bottom of the pillars in front, that's called Carthage marble. And it pulls the line, your eye along the line of horizontal. He also then did a trick with the bricks where he deeply raked the mortar on the horizontal lines. And so as you got closer, again, your, yep. line, your eye would be drawn along that line. A prairie style house also would have deep overhanging eaves. And you certainly see that in our house. Um, the eaves give the house a real practical sense of protection. They also give an emotional sense of protection to the clients and their guests. As they walk up to the house, they're immediately covered and enveloped and protected by the house. And those eaves have also protected the windows there are over 280 windows, um, art glass windows in the house, and all of them are original. Every single one of them is over 100 years old. And so the house has done a good job of doing its protection. Another element of a prairie style home is the hipped roof. And that means that the two, all four sides are slanted in. And so that gives it a lower profile rather than a peaked roof. So even with that second story that you see up there, the house has that very low profile. And then another element of a prairie style home are long bands of windows. And you see a little bit of that here with these living room windows. Um, you'll see another example in the back of a um, long hallway on the second floor that's lined with many windows. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to use native materials as much as possible. And in the case of, for instance, the um, falling water, which is in Bear Run, Pennsylvania, they actually quarried the stone for that um, home right on the property. So it's not always possible to do exactly that, but he's still using materials that are um, available, certainly maybe a little more closely located. The Carthage marble comes from Carthage, Missouri. And the tile that you've seen on both the roof and you'll see tiles on the floor. Those come from a company called Ludowicki. And that company had a quarry in Southeast Kansas. And so that's likely where those tiles came from. Um, so this is the backyard. You can see the terrace, you can see the, the bog pond, and you see again, those long bands of windows in the back. When Henry and Elsie moved to the house. Um, they were encouraged by some of the things that Frank Lloyd Wright was wanting to do, and they accepted that. They were they knew they had Frank Lloyd Wright as their architect, and so they were willing to go along with the designs that he wanted to apply to their house. Because when Frank Lloyd Wright is designing a home, he is never just designing the exterior or the shell of the home. He is always designing the entire entity. Um, and so that includes the interiors. And that includes applying a lot of his design ideas 
to both the outside and the inside. Here, what you see is the top of the pillars. This is near the front door of the house. And these pillars show the very first example of what Frank Lloyd Wright would call the grammar of this house, and that's the square. And you're gonna see that um, repeated through the house as, as if it was one entity or one piece of art that he has created. And he thought that it elevated the lives of his clients by living in this piece of art he had created. So this is the first thing that as you walk in the door and particularly in 1918, um, you might have been a little alarmed at the exposed brick walls in the house. And, um, but the Allens apparently were not afraid of it. And one of the things that Frank Lloyd Wright told them was that if he were allowed to gild the mortar between those bricks on the horizontal lines in the house, that that would make the house more elegant. And so here in this picture, you can see that gilding just a bit. Now he only did that in one other home and that was the Darwin Martin House in Buffalo, New York. And the Darwin Martin House has un undergone a lot of um, restoration and in fact, recreation. Some of it had been destroyed and had to be rebuilt completely from scratch. So this is a photo from that house that shows that gilding done at a more uh, modern time. And so that's likely more like what the Allens had in their house was more of that brighter color. So it's something to kind of imagine when, you, when you're visiting the Allen house. Another thing that you'll see in the Allen house, and I wish I could give you an entire tour, um, but since we're limited to photos, I will show you elements that you see. This is the entryway and this is the floor there. And what I wanted to illustrate with this photo is that all of the building elements that we saw outside have come right in the house. So you see that red tile that was outside and was on, top, on the roof, and then the Carthage marble in these steps, and then the brick that he brought inside the house. So he's always blurring the lines between inside and outside. And particularly with this prairie style, he called his uh, architecture organic architecture. He really revered nature and everything about it. Um, and his homes were supposed to be an element of nature, to honor nature and bring it into the home. So here's an example of one of the first pieces of uh, furniture that you would see in the Allen house. And this is something that Frank Lloyd Wright liked to do a lot, and particularly in his Usonian homes. And that was to have built-in furniture. Um, when you built it in, the clients couldn't move it around, they couldn't take it out, and so it stayed where Frank Lloyd Wright intended for it to be. So that was one reason. Another was um, practicality. It saved space in homes, and he was always designing the space specifically around that family that he was designing that home for and what they would do in their home. So this entryway is where the Allens would have received visitors. And uh, remember, this is 1918, so it's a more formal time. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright worked with several artisans on all of the different elements of the house. On the furniture, in this case, he was working with a man called George Niedekin. And George Niedekin was an artist in his own right. He, um, he painted a couple of murals for Frank Lloyd Wright in other homes. But he had formed a furniture manufacturing company with his brother-in-law. And so they were the ones who were manufacturing this furniture that Frank Lloyd Wright designed. They worked, Frank Lloyd Wright worked with him for on about a dozen houses, and this was the last. And then this is another design element that of course is really critical to the house. And that's those art glass windows. And they come in every size, every shape, they're long and skinny, they're short and fat. They are um, every kind of um, iteration you could possibly think of. And so this is one example. They not only reflect the grammar of the house because you obviously see the squares here, but they also reflect the color scheme of the house. And that's gonna be the green cream and the ochre or the gold color. And then that's going to be um, a theme that runs through the entire home. 
And here's another one of those uh, long and narrow windows. And then this is the dining room in the house. It's one of the first really awe-inspiring um, rooms that people see, I think, when they come. And here in the dining room, we have the table and chairs, which are all original. Those are furniture designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and manufactured by George Niedekin. And that light fixture tends to catch people's eyes as well. That kind of lighting Frank Lloyd Wright was doing in the 1800s, um, and especially in some of the larger homes that were in the bigger cities, Chicago, um, you know, electricity was new. And electricity was certainly new in Wichita. And the most affluent families would have it. And the Allens, of course, certainly did. And thank goodness, because of Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, is going to take advantage of that with his lighting. And this picture, of course, reflects, again, the grammar of the room with the squares. And here's a close up of one of those squares. And this is a figure that, um, you know, it reflects the, the color scheme. It is using a chevron shape and just add interest to the room. And when you look at the, the overall, again, you might notice if you look closely that each one of those are turned um, 90 degrees. So that adds interest to that whole light fixture above. And this is another um, design of art glass in the house. This is in all of the cabinets. And we have cabinets in both the dining room and the living room. And again, he plays on that chevron shape, but he emphasizes the green a little more and the cream color. And so this is a complete departure from that light fixture. When Frank Lloyd Wright is designing these art glass pieces, for the homes and the windows. Again, every single one of them is individual. He doesn't repeat these designs in any other person's house or any other building. And this then is a close up of that, that same um, cabinet. And then the lighting fixtures. Frank Lloyd Wright leaves nothing to chance when he's designing a home. So this is one of the very first light fixtures that you'll see when you enter the house. It's in the entryway. And first of all, I, I always wonder if I could ever actually count the number of squares that are incorporated into that one feature. Um, there are many. And it's also a place where he uses mulberry paper. This is the first house that he used that in. Um, it really harkens back to his influence of Japanese culture. Frank Lloyd Wright was a collector of uh, Japanese woodblock prints, and he was able to visit Japan in 1905, and he really fell in love with everything about Japan, the architecture, the culture, um, the art. And so while this house was being built, Frank Lloyd Wright was actually working on the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. That was a big commission for him at the time. And so there are many Japanese influences that you'll see in the house as you visit. This is upstairs in Mr. Allen's study. And specifically, I wanted to highlight the light fixture here, which is another Nidakan light fixture. And there is one other in the house that's like this, and that's in Mrs. Allen's day room. And she, that was also her office. So they both had workspace where they had these light fixtures that matched. This ceiling is a unique ceiling in the room, or in, I'm sorry, in the house. You can see that it's an inverted hipped shape, and it's, he's taken just a few pieces of, of trim and really made that ceiling even a work of art all by itself, which is very like Frank Lloyd Wright. And then this is a light fixture that you see a lot in the house. It's one of the smaller ones, kind of an everyday one, but what it reflects to me is not only Frank Lloyd Wright's um, adherence to his design grammar, which is the square, obviously, but his, um, 
is knowledge of the kinds of things that people might do in their house. So for instance, these uncovered light bulbs will give you the brightest light. In those days, in 1918, the highest wattage bulb was a 20 watt bulb. And so, you know, it wasn't very bright, but with these being uncovered, they gave the brightest possible light. So in our kitchen, these are the only kind of light fixtures we have. And then in other rooms, he's placed these in places where a person might need some kind of task lighting. And again, it really goes to Frank Lloyd Wright thinking about his people actually living in that house and what they're going to do from day to day. This is another eye catcher, and this is in the living room. And this light fixture is a series of actually 40 light fixtures. Each one of those designs has hinges on it so that it can be opened and the light bulb can be changed. And when you're looking at the design, you should keep in mind, again, it's 1918. And so they don't have the modern power tools that we have today. And so these were um, all cut out by hand, not only once, but 40 times. And I often wonder if there were any mistakes and, you know, there was a pile of um, some scrap. <laughs> and then this is a picture of the entire living room. And there is no picture that can do this living room justice. This is from the back of the room facing toward the front where the fireplace is. And in the shadow, you can see a small ingle nook. Um, the living room is 25 feet wide by 50 feet long. But Frank Lloyd Wright would not consider the home or the living room just 25 feet wide because to him, he considered the outside space living space as well. And he accommodated that by extending the, the veranda straight out from the living room. There are three terrace doors on the right-hand right side of your screen. And so the Allens used it that way. They would place oriental rugs and wicker furniture out there. And when they entertained, that almost doubled the space that they could um, ha have guests in their home. And not only was um, Henry Allen the owner of the Wichita Eagle, he also became governor of the state of Kansas. And it's interesting because he was, um, this is the time of World War I, and Mr. Allen was too old to serve in the military. At the time this house was being built and the time he lived in it, he was in his mid forties. And so he was working with the Red Cross and eventually the YMCA. And he was in France the entire time this house was being built. And so that's why he would write letters back and forth to Elsie asking her how their house on the hill was coming. She was the one who was in Wichita watching the building, making sure that things were happening right. Um, and she and her daughter, Henrietta, were able to move into the house in May of 1918. This is that ingle nook that was in shadow in the, the previous picture. And this is a really common feature of a Frank Lloyd Wright house. First of all, you won't find a Frank Lloyd Wright home or building, business building that doesn't have a fireplace. It simply does not exist. He thought the fireplace was the symbolic heart of the home. It was so important, he often built almost entire rooms around the fireplace. And he certainly emphasized the fireplace here in the living room with this small ingle nook where a person could sit and warm up by the fire. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't catch it in this photo, but there is a light fixture on the wall right near there so that if a person was one to read or something, they would be able to, to see to do that. And this is one of those pieces of furniture that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, designed and the Nidikins manufactured. We have over 40 pieces of original furniture in the house. And this is very significant. This couch 
um, is one of a kind. There are cantilevered arms that have eliminated the need for side tables. So it keeps that nice clean look that Frank Lloyd Wright was going for in a living room. Remember, this is 1918. This is the middle of the country. Um, they would have been much more used to um, heavily decorated Victorian type parlors. So this would have been a real departure for people who were visiting. And this is a library table that is in the living room. And on that library table, you see a bust, and that is of their daughter, Henrietta. Henrietta was the only child who lived in the house with them. The Allens had four children total. Their first two children were Frederick and Catherine, and they were born in 1893 and 1895. Unfortunately, this is a time where there are no vaccines, and so they died of diphtheria, and they died in 1897 when they were just toddlers, really. Um, then the Allens had Henrietta in 1900, and Henrietta lived until, until she was uh, 72, so she lived a good long life. And then tragically, they also then had a son who was born in 1902, and his name was Justin. And he was in a bicycle accident and died of a brain injury. So the Allens really suffered some loss in their family. And so Henrietta was very doted upon. She was, um, she was a little bit of an old maid. She didn't marry until she was 32. But when she did, she married right there in the Allen house in front of the fireplace in the living room. And this is a photograph of her. When she did marry, she married a man named Julius Holmes. And he was an ambassador. Um, at that time, he was, he was stationed in Bucharest. And that's where Henrietta's first two of her three children were born, is in Bucharest. And her first grandchild that she had for the Allens she named after her father, and his name was Henry Justin Holmes. And then this is the kitchen. And before we leave the, the downstairs, I really wanted to point out in particular the cabinets, because these really are a very good reflection of one of Frank Lloyd Wright's principles. He had developed several principles that he worked with his entire life. And he uh, published those in a book called In the Cause of Architecture very early in his career. And one of those principles was that you bring out the beauty and the nature of the material you choose to use. So if he were going to use wood in some fashion, he would never paint it. And you see a good example of that here. These cabinets are all made of red gum and that is a hardwood. It was a common building material in uh, the early 1900s, but it was expensive. So it was only in the, the most affluent homes. And you can really appreciate the beauty of, um, of the grain of the wood in these cabinets. This is one of the fireplaces um, that is in the dining room. Frank Lloyd Wright, as I mentioned, um, would always include a fireplace and our house actually has five. And so we have the one in the living room, we have one here in the dining room, there's one in the entryway, and then there are two more upstairs in the private rooms. And Frank Lloyd Wright would also design the log racks and the andirons. And these again are a really good example of using his grammar. So you see that in the uh, details of these, this log rack. And this is in the second story of the house. And so this is the private quarters. Um, this is the master bedroom. Frank Lloyd Wright thought of bedrooms as sleeping cubicles. And so he didn't put the emphasis on the uh, decor and the um, elaborateness of his furniture. So these are things that are designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and manufactured by the Niedekins, but again, they're more simple. And one of the things that you notice are there, there is task lighting above each of the beds. 
and each of those also have their own individual pull chain so that one person could read in bed and the other could have theirs turned off. This is in Mrs. Allen's day room. I mentioned it earlier. So she had her separate room where she could do her correspondence and, and um, her um, toilet for the day. And so this is one of the pieces of furniture that is in this room. It's one of my favorites. And this is a picture of a toilet. And the reason that I include this picture is because it is a wall hung toilet. And Frank Lloyd Wright invented the wall hung toilet. He was asked to design his very first office building and that was the Larkin office building and that was in Buffalo. And when he designed that office building, he did the same thing there that he does in his homes. He designed everything and that included the um, desks, the chairs, and it also extended to the toilets. And what he was doing, the idea behind this, is again, he's thinking about cleanliness because disease is so important. And so the wall hung toilet allows to be mopped underneath. And that's exactly why these kinds of fixtures are used in hospitals and nursing homes and medical facilities. Um, he had modified that design just a bit from what he had used in the Larkin office building and was using it at the Imperial Hotel. And so he brought these, these to the Allen House. Now the Allen House had the five fireplaces. It also has five bathrooms. And that would have been extremely unusual in those days to have that number of bathrooms. Um, but it really, to me, goes back to how much Frank Lloyd Wright was thinking about the comfort of the guests and the people as well that lived in the house. There was a small powder room downstairs that people could use if they were visiting. And then upstairs, each of the sleeping spaces had their own bathrooms. So again, um, people wouldn't have to share and they had their own private spaces. So we go outside for a minute because um, I want to show you again, we have that long band of windows that's such a feature of a prairie style house. And then I want you to notice the two uh, squares that are sticking up from the roof. And those are actually two of the five bathrooms. And one of the reasons they are significant is that they have 16 foot ceilings. And you can see that there are art glass windows there. Those windows can open. And Frank Lloyd Wright's idea was that if hot air rises and it has a place to escape, it creates just that much more ventilation throughout the house. So this house that is only one room wide in every instance, and that means the bedrooms along the east-west arm of the house, and then the living room that runs from the north to south. And so in a time when there's no air conditioning, when these windows could all be opened and they all had screens on them in that time, that was really keeping this house nice and comfortable. And the first bathroom or the first square that you see towards the left of the screen, that was the bathroom that we just saw. That one belonged to Henrietta. And then the second one that you see closer to the right of the screen is for the guest suite. So this house included not only quarters for the family, but also a guest suite at the end of the hallway. And since there are two of those bathrooms and they allow the house to breathe, Frank Lloyd Wright referred to those as the nostrils. And still outside, there are features in the gardens that, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright is going to design, and that includes um, the planters. And here you can see our bold planter. This has actually been licensed by the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation for reproduction. So you can buy one of these large planters. Um, I think they come in several sizes, actually, and they ship directly to your home. So then we don't stock them at the gift shop at the Allen House. Um, but they are definitely original. 
And from here, you can you get a good view of, again, those materials that I talked about outside in front of the house, inside the house, and then right back here outside in the courtyard. And you see that tile, and you see the Carthage marble and the brick. And now you can see the planters on the outside garden wall. And he uses a bowl shape for those planters. And again, when you con contrast that against all of the squares that he's been using in the house, it, it really provides a contrast, um, although they are sitting on square pedestals. And one of the things that he specified is that they use ground up oyster shell when they were mixing the cement for these so that they would match the Carthage marble that they sit on perfectly. And you can see that they do. Each one of those is original and um, has been with the house for over 100 years. And then last here at the Allen House, this is a tea house that anchors the corner of the backyard or the courtyard. And originally this was planned to be the garage of the house. Um, but the Allens had asked for some larger rooms upstairs and so Frank Lloyd Wright kept that structure there, but he uh, reinvented it into a tea house. It had all screened in, so the Allens could use it as um, a place to entertain or to even sit in the evenings. And that tea house has a basement underneath, and that basement is accessed from beyond the wall you see there at the pond. And that, that's where the gardener would keep their uh, tools, their gardening tools. And they certainly did need a full-time gardener as they had to tend all those planters, all the gardens there. And then there was a lot on the other side of the house that the Allens also owned. We currently use it as a parking lot, but it was also in gardens at that time. So um, now I want to talk about the other building in Wichita. And I do have to stress that my expertise is about the Allen House. And so I've given you a lot of information about it. Um, I have less history and information about the Corbin Education Center, but I do want to stress, first of all, the Allen House was completed in 1918, was designed in 1956. I'm sorry, 1915 and completed in 1918. This was pretty early in Frank Lloyd's Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's career, despite the fact that he was middle age. You're talking about um, the time when he became, began to become more well known. So it was early in his career. And then this is very late in his career. He designed it in 1956. He died in 1959. And it was built, it was completed in 1964. And that's when the university had the money and, and um, oh. had the, the resources to get the building built. Um, it is based on a building that Frank Lloyd Wright was designing for um, Baghdad. It was the Post and Telegraph building. And so it really has a lot of features that harken back to the, that design that he had um, created. Now, that was never completed. So WSU is definitely a place for people to um, visit, and they are very used to people coming, taking pictures of the, the building and um, visiting, coming through, but it is still used as a education building. They hold, they hold classes there as well as office. It's a, a combination of two buildings, and it has a connection between the two. So again, really really emblematic of Frank Lloyd Wright's late architecture. So then I wanna talk about the other ways that Frank Lloyd Wright was um, influencing architecture. And first of all, that was in the form of John Hickman. John Hickman is an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright. He came to Wichita when he was a, a child. He went to school here. And eventually he was working as an illustrator at an aircraft company. 
Well, World War II came along and he became a fighter pilot. Um, but after the war, he came back to Wichita and he completed the work toward his uh, high school diploma. And at that same time, he was also working again as an illustrator for one of the aircraft companies. After he completed his high school diploma, he left Wichita and he went to the University of Illinois and that's where he studied architecture. And that's also where he was connected with Frank Lloyd Wright and worked under Frank Lloyd Wright as, a, as an apprentice. And he, he did that in 1947 was when he worked with Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he did return to Wichita and he worked for the architectural firm Thomas and Harris and then he started his own um, architectural firm and, call, and it was called Architects Associated and he formed that company with Arthur Woodman in, in 1954. And so that's when this building was designed and built, 1954. It's the Vickers Petroleum Service Station. It is an example of the bat wing um, design. It was, um, it was not unknown, but it was somewhat unusual, and it's certainly unusual these days to find that. And the, it, this is in Hayesville, Kansas, if somebody's not familiar. Um, and Hayesville has actually completed the process of getting this added to the National Register of Historical Places. And the Hayesville Chamber of Commerce offices in this building so that it will be saved for perpetuity, we hope, um, sometimes that isn't that still isn't a guarantee, but Hayesville certainly has taken as many actions as they can to save this building. There are a couple of homes here in Wichita also that John Hickman designed. And the first one is his own home for his own family. He had four daughters. So he designed a rather large home. You see that at the bottom of the screen, the brown house. And um, it had five bedrooms, five baths. It was, it, it, it is, sorry, an enormous house. I had the opportunity to drive by recently and it is very back from the street. It's on three acres. And so um, it is, it's a really beautiful home. The other house that you see here is the house on Seifkin Lane, and this one was done as 1961. And what I was fortunate enough, as I was doing research for this presentation, I was fortunate enough to find some additional photos of this property. And this is the rear of the Hickman house. And so you can get really more of a feel for how long and low it has a hipped roof. Um, it has some angles to it. But inside are a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright influences. Now, these are my own observations. These are not anything that is academic in nature. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. But the first things that strike me are the tile floor, um, the prominence of the fireplace, and the interior brick, and then also those built-in. Another thing that occurs to me is the ceiling of the room, where there is a little bit of a trim used that um, draws your eye upward. So you even notice that, that the ceiling has a pattern to it. This is a color version of the same room from a different angle. So you definitely see those um, 50s and 60s vibes going on here with the colors. And here's another photograph. Now this is the entryway in the, in the same house. And this is a more current photograph. And so the owners have done some significant changes to the house, but you still see those tile floors. Even through the paint, you can tell that there is most definitely a brick wall there. 
And then this is that same living room that we've been looking at. So the insert for the fireplace has changed. They've painted, they've carpeted, but you still see that tile. And then the ceiling has been considerably um, changed with a different, um, a different treatment and then also the, hot, the skylight. And then this is an example of the kitchen, which has been extensively re renovated. But again, the things that occur to me are the um, opaque lights, or I'm sorry, windows above the, fit, the kitchen area, the sink there. And those are definitely original. As well as in the other photograph, you see again, some build-ins, which would be Frank Lloyd Wright kind of style. And here are a couple of other pictures of that same kitchen. And then this is the Siefkin house. And um, there were not very many interior photos available that I could find, but one of them that struck me is this window that you see in the lower right-hand corner and the way it meets in the middle Frank Lloyd Wright did that same kind of method in most notably falling water. And there is uh, windows there that have no um, visible structure in the middle. So when, especially when they open, it appears that there's absolutely nothing there. You look right out into nature, which again was such an important feature for Frank Lloyd Wright. And then these were a couple of things, again, that in the house struck me. The brick, um, the tile that you see at the fireplace, and then, of course, the built-in desk with the, the um, drawers there, again, seemed to harken back to what kinds of things Frank Lloyd Wright would include in a home. Then this home is listed, um, or is labeled as the Tilford House. And then um, in that labeling, there seems to be some question as to whether that's exactly what this is. Now, I apologize that I wasn't able to do um, any further research to find out exactly what was going on with this house in particular, but the Tilford house is a John Hickman design. And I was even able to find some interior photos. And again, you see those elements that Frank Lloyd Wright would have included a tile that has a little different design to it. You see the wood paneling in that entryway. In the, the cathedral ceiling, you see some um, trim that again kind of uh, makes your eye draw upward and you see some recessed lighting along that soffit in the um, in the living room. And again, that was something Frank Lloyd Wright definitely did. Another good example of some of that recessed lighting was in the living room of falling water. So eventually um, in 1961, John Hickman partnered with Roy Varenhorst and they formed what was called the John, John Hickman and Associates Architects and Planning Consultants. And so Roy Varenhorst, um, you may know those two names as being associated with um, Century 2 specifically, but Abla Library was designed in that time frame. When they began the project, it was called the Wichita, Wichita State University Library. And eventually at the dedication, it was named um, for the Abla, so it's the Abla Library. And Roy Varenhorst uh, was born in Conway Springs, Kansas, and he went to high school there. He received his degree in architecture from Kansas State University, so he was a local boy. He also served in war. He was served in Korea as a naval pilot, and he earned many honors in his naval service. Um, eventually, as I said, John Hickman apprenticed with Frank Lloyd Wright in 1947. Roy Varenhorst apprenticed with Frank Lloyd Wright in 1957. 
So that is not where their paths crossed was during their time with Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, it, I really, I don't have any story about when they met, but they were both in Wichita and John Hickman was um, definitely had his own architecture firm. So it makes sense that the two Frank Lloyd Wright apprentices would eventually join forces. I also have another photo of Abla Library from above. And then this is Ray Woodman Elementary School in South Wichita. And it is very difficult to really capture that building. Um, so the photograph that you see comes from uh, the Wichita Eagle when the old tree, old cottonwood tree got hit by lightning and a good portion of that came down. So what I've included here is a footprint of, Frank, of Ray Woodman. And um, John Hickman described Ray Woodman as a helping hand and the presentation booklet that he created and presented to the, the school board was labeled a helping hand to the future. And a quote from John Hickman says that the building resembles the hand, fingers outspread with the palm as the center. Classrooms run the length of the fingers, each for children of close age, ability, and grade. All fingers join at the palm, which contains more specialized spaces appropriate to elementary education. And I can speak to it personally because this is where I did go to elementary school. And I very much remember being in the different wings, um, A wing when you were a baby and just a kindergartner and eventually B and C wing as you got older. And that center space was multi-purpose. And so it was round, it would um, section off, and that's where we had PE, and eventually then later in the day, that's where we had our lunch. And I can tell you during PE, they still hung those stupid ropes from the ceiling, and I was the kid who could never reach the top, ever. <laughs> and then this is probably um, their most well-known work here in Wichita. And that, of course, is Century Two Performing Arts and Convention Center. And this was completed in 1969. Um, there are several of Frank Lloyd Wright's later works that really show how they influenced. And there is more than two, but I'm using two um, examples tonight. And the first one is the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church. It's actually in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Um, Milwaukee is their mailing address. And this was designed again, right around that same time Frank Lloyd Wright is doing the Corbin Education Center. So it's designed in 1956, but not completed until after his death. And it was completed in 1961. And of course, the thing that stands out to you here is that large blue roof that really resembles the sky overhead. And then this is the Marin County Civic Center in uh, San Rafael, California. It is a huge building complex. It um, goes across a street with a, um, a, a uh, walkway overhead. And again, it has these elements of this round circular roof you can see the half circles that are in this as well. And so when you go back to looking at Century Two, you really do see that influence from Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is a postcard um, that was uh, from about that time. That's a period postcard that I found. And um, I also found some other photographs. This is the one of the renderings that came from John Hickman and Roy Varenhorst. And so this is when they were proposing Century Two. There's a little bit more of a close up. And then this shows, when you look in the right hand corner, I think it's interesting that 
Roy Varenhorst and John Hickman also have their own logo. And they do that in a square, which is exactly what Frank Lloyd Wright did with his own logo or um, the shape that represented him on his stationery and on business cards. Early in his career, he had a Cherokee red square with a Celtic design in it. And it simplified over the years. And eventually, certainly by the time he was working with this gentleman, he, he just had a solid red square. He was famous enough, he didn't even have to put his name in his square. But Roy Varenhorst and John Hickman did. And then these are some section perspectives that I found. And this is for the convention hall space. And it shows that with, um, with all of the seating so that they had a stage performance here. Those of us who have attended events in, in Century 2 know that those seats roll back and so you have the wide open floor. This is of course the, th the theater, what's called the Mary Jane Teal Theater at this point. And then this is the concert hall. And I bet there are a lot of people who have attended concerts in this building as well. And then this is a cutaway of the um, model. And this is with the roof removed so that the different spaces could be viewed. And then this is a photograph. And Roy Varenhorst is on the left side of the screen. And then that's the mayor, Vincent Bogart. And again, Roy Varenhorst is pointing out elements of um, the design. Now, unfortunately, in April of 1964, John Hickman actually committed suicide and um, was very sad. He was only 38 years old. So he had many, many more years of designing iconic buildings. Um, but one of the things that happened shortly after his death is that Roy Varenhorst was called to a meeting of the Sedgwick County Commissioners and the mayor, and he was able to assure them that um, the original vision for the design of Century 2 was going to be able to be carried out without any problems. And then um, just a kind of at the last minute, I was able to find these construction photographs. And again, so interesting. It's interesting to look around the building um, to the things that are and aren't there anymore. And here's another photograph while it's in process. And then yet another one. And then this, of course, is the panel that um, is applied to the building itself. So they're listing the mayors and the commissioners that worked on the project from its beginning in 1961, when they first decided that Wichita needed a civic center, um, a fine arts building in order to serve the city of Wichita. And for any of you that don't know, the reason that it's called Century Two is that it was to take us into the second century of Wichita's um, lifetime. Wichita was incorporated in 1870. So in 1970 was when we were celebrating our 100 years. And the dedication actually happened in January of 1969. So the name was to invoke the, the fact that we were moving into the second century of Wichita and uh, we were becoming a more culturally centered um, town, city. And, and so it was an exciting time when this building first opened. And um, there are lots of us that remember that. There are some of us that don't. There are some of us that love that big red or big blue roof, and there are some that don't. But um, it is Century 2. It is part of our, um, 
our city skyline. And it is also, again, a very, very much influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright and his di design ideas. And so when people say that an apprentice designed this building, that has significance. And so I'm happy to be able to give this information to people. I hope maybe you learned something new and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Wow, uh, Sonia, thank you so much. That was amazing. And I was so cool to see all those pictures of the Allen House and the other photos of the, of the uh, Frank Lloyd buildings and other buildings. Um, we've, uh, we've had some questions come in that I, I'll start reading and then anybody else, um, if, if you want to, uh, those of you on Zoom can uh, click on the little Q&A symbol and type your question there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can uh, type your question in the comments there. Um, I'll, be, I'll be pulling from both and answer as many as we, uh, as seems reasonable, I guess. Um, and uh, so I will just start, let's see here. Um, I guess one, well, here's a question. Um, did, did the, does the Allen House have, uh, have heating or what's the, what's the heating system like for the Allen House? Allen House definitely has heating. In fact, it has radiators throughout the house. And in several places, especially in the downstairs areas where the Allens might entertain, Frank Lloyd Wright would um, use grills, wooden grills that he incorporated into um, the cabinets. And then he used floating bookshelves in the living room where there was a lot of space underneath, there was a lot of space behind, and those actually covered up the radiators in the living room. The Allen house was so warm that even the uh, garage was heated. It had the um, radiator elements in there, and that was to keep those cars warm because in, on cold Kansas mornings in 1918, you're going out to a car that has a hand crank. And so if it was already warmed up, it was a little easier for the chauffeur, which the Allens had a chauffeur, um, it was easier for him to hand crank that car and get it started. So yes, they most definitely had a heating system. Well, thank you. Um, another, another question. Um, uh, someone, I, I it scrolled off my screen, but someone had asked about um, Wesley Peters is a name that they had heard associated with Century Two. Um, are you are you familiar with with that and what what his involvement was? Wesley Peters was a man who worked with Frank Lloyd Wright um, nearly his entire adult life, and he was very closely associated to Frank Lloyd Wright not only in business but also in life, as he married um, the daughter of Frank Lloyd Wright's um, wife, his third wife, and they had uh, two children together. And so Wes Peters was, um, he worked with the Taliesin architect, so beyond Frank Lloyd Wright's death, he was still with the Talies Taliesin architects who oversaw some of those projects that were post Frank Lloyd Wright's um, death. Now, I don't know his involvement, his specific involvement with um, Century 2. I would not be surprised if he were um, consulted, but I don't have any specifics about his involvement, um, especially with Roy Varenhorst and, and um, John Hickman. Okay, yeah, interesting, thanks. Um, here's a question from Jeff. Did, did Mr. Wright ever visit the Allen House, whether before or after construction? He most definitely visited the Allen House. Um, one of the things that Frank Lloyd Wright had was what he called his fellowship, and that was his work with the apprentices. And um, as that developed, he worked with them during the summer in Wisconsin, and he wintered in Arizona at what's known as Taliesin West. And so the drive between the two places made Wichita a nice place to stop, well, we specifically know that he stopped and, or I'm sorry, visited in 1937. We have good documentation that he was here in Wichita and that he stayed with the Allens. There are newspaper articles that talk about him being there and that the Allens hosted him. And so in the Allen house, we have this guest suite and we know that that's where Frank Lloyd Wright slept 
So that's one of the exciting things I always think of about the house. Wow. Uh, here's a question from Chrissy, or Christy. Uh, what is your favorite design element of the Allen House and uh, why is it special to you? I've never been asked that. Um, I think what I would say is the windows and the design that he chose. He is really well known for having sometimes some very intricate and, um, and certainly beautiful windows. But the Wichita windows just really reflect kind of our down home values. Uh, they're simple. They're beautiful. The colors match the Kansas landscape, which I am very in love with. And so really for me, those windows probably represent what I like most about um, Wichita and what I like most about the way Frank Lloyd Wright would consider the people that he was designing a home for. Yeah, those windows really struck me. I, I was kind of wondering myself, um, do you, do you know what was Frank Lloyd Wright influenced by painters or you know modernist visual artists in in the design of these windows? The design of his windows almost always came from nature, and they would be abstract versions of plants. Many times, there's a sumac window, there's a tree of life window. Um, so most of the time, they are abstractions of nature. Um, again, in our house, we have something just a little bit different. You know, when you look at our Kansas prairies, of course, you can find flowers and other vegetation, but you see the horizon and you see those colors. And um, it seems like that's really what he was going with. He got the gold of the, the waving wheat right for sure. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Here's a question from Dion. It's kind of kind of timely. You know, the 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 Spanish flu pandemic was around the time when this was being uh, designed and built. Uh, do you know if that had any impact on on the construction and completion of the house? That's a really interesting question because um, there is so little documentation about the Spanish flu. Um, probably the most authoritative book that I have encountered would be John Barry's. Um, book about the Spanish flu, and I'm sorry the title escapes me at this time. I don't know of any kinds of ways that it influenced or had anything had to do with the house. I don't get that impression from the correspondence that was going back and forth between Mrs. Allen and Mr. Allen, and actually anybody can look up that correspondence. It is at the um, Kansas Historical Society. And so through their website, you can find that those letters, those communications as well. And they do not speak of the Spanish flu or the flu in any kind of way. That's interesting. Um, yeah, and I, and I've, I did some, some reading on the Spanish flu um, back a while ago. And similar, similar thing, of course, World War One was happening then and that really um, really was dist was uh, dominating a lot of headlines at that time as well. Um, I, you know, I saw a few people comment about, um, especially like the, they didn't, the, the dining room chairs, they didn't think looked very comfortable, but you know, the, the living room couch looked a little more plush. And I, and I was kind of just thinking, you know, this was a luxury house for the period. And if you think about how luxury homes were built today, you would expect, you know, more squashy couch, plush couches, you know, whirlpool jacuzzi baths. And then I noticed in the, in the bedroom photo you showed, it's, it's, it's small beds. It's unimaginable a luxury home not having a king size bed today. So I just want to have, has the idea of what counts as luxury kind of changed over the past century? Well, first of all, those chairs that Frank Lloyd Wright designed for the dining room. Um, this was a period when he was designing very straight and often tall back chairs. Um, you see those tall back chairs in the Roby house specifically. And one of the things to keep in mind is the time frame in which the house was built, 1918. 
So ladies of that time were still wearing well-boned corsets that cinched them in and actually that um, high back or that straight back chair provided quite a bit of support to them while they were sitting in the dining room. And even Frank Lloyd Wright admitted that his furniture was not always comfortable, but he did gradually relax the styles over time. And in fact, he's designed, and um, this is available to see at the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City. There are a couple of his chairs there, and one of them is actually a recliner. Um, it still doesn't look anywhere like the recliners that we see today, but he did begin to have more, or consider at least comfort eventually. Still, the actual aesthetic was more important than the actual comfort. Uh, here's a question from uh, Pat. He, um, Pat asked, uh, Wright, al Wright also designed a Usonian home to be built near Crestview Country Club, uh, but it was never built. This is, this is what Pat says. Um, do you know if the plans are available for viewing or have you seen anything about that? Um, that would be the Holt House. And uh, the story behind that is that when Frank Lloyd Wright was in Wichita, the Holt family asked, that, asked him to design a, um, an affordable home for them using some of the materials that they owned a company and was a window company. I believe that's right. And um, so he did design a home and it was really as he was approaching his Usonian um, period. And the idea behind his Usonians was that they were um, affordable. He had a different building technique, different building materials that he would use, and they were smaller homes. So they were for the average American, and he wanted the average American to be able to have a beautiful home. So the Holtz approach to him said they had $5,000 to build their home. So he did a design, and he gave it to them. They showed it to a builder, and the builder said that they would have to guarantee $10,000 because he was going to build that home the way Frank Lloyd Wright said, and it would fall down and he would have to rebuild it. And the Holtz didn't have that much money to commit to the project. And so it was never realized. And so then the very first Usonian home became one that was um, inspired by those plans. And that was for the Jacobs family. And so the Jacobs family got their, the first Usonian and not the Holt family. That's, uh, that's interesting. Um, here's another question that kind of go, goes into the economic side. Um, at the time of the Allen House's completion, uh, what was the cost? Well, the property records at that time show that the house was worth 22,200. And to put that in perspective, other homes in the same neighborhood were five to $7,000 and you know maybe a $10,000 house. And this was a very affluent neighborhood. So the 22,200 was a considerable amount, um, but it wasn't the most expensive house, certainly in the neighborhood, not even on the block. A very large house on the opposite corner of that same block that belonged to the Brown family. And it's much, much larger. Um, the other number that I have seen associated with the house is 30,000. And the difference between the two is the furniture. And that was a part of the, a part and parcel of the deal when Frank Lloyd Wright was designing the home was that furniture. And while they were not committed to buying every single piece, and they didn't, they certainly bought the vast majority of it. And, um, and we're lucky about that today. Yeah, that is great. I, you said, yeah, a lot, an amazing amount of original furnishings uh, still there. Um, and actually, I was, um, I was curious when, when did, and maybe you could also talk about some, some folks did ask about, um, about like how and when they could visit. Maybe you could talk about that. But it kind of tied in with that. I was wondering when did the Allen House uh, become, you know, a museum? Amy, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, the Allen House Foundation was created in 1990, 
and restoration began shortly after that. Um, the house is probably 98% complete um, as far as restoration goes. We have given to tour, private tours throughout the years and throughout the restoration in areas that were completed. Um, just here in the last five, about five years, we've started with public tours. We do tours Wednesday through Saturday at various times. Um, we have the, all those listed on our website. Um, with coronavirus, we've kind of scaled back a little bit. We used to take 25 people on a tour. Now we can only take four because of our social distancing. So if you are interested in coming, you just want to check our calendar um, because the tours are limited and they, the tickets sell quickly. Um, but all that's on our website. Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks too for, uh, for uh, this, uh, this program, which has allowed a lot, of, a lot more people to, to get a look inside. Um, I don't know how long you want to keep going. We've got more questions, but um, if you guys are, let me see. Maybe a here. couple maybe, more? Yeah, maybe a couple more here. Sure. Um, let's see. Let's find... Let's find one that, that we haven't talked about yet. Um, oh, um, the another another local some local building. Someone asked if the Mark Arts building, if if you know if that could be right influenced, and I'm not sure if they're. I think they're referring to the new building, but maybe the old building too. I don't know if you know anything about those. I would guess that maybe they're talking about the old building on Central, and. Amy, there is a bit of a connection. I'm, um, I'm blanking on what I saw when I was doing research where it mentioned that building. Do you know, have more information? Well, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, they had asked Frank Lloyd Wright to design a building um, for the Wichita Art Association, um, but they didn't have the funds raised. Um, I think that question is referring to the new building because the shape of the roof is similar to the Vickers gas station, how the bat wing, how it comes up to the point. Um, I don't know if specifically that's what they were going for. I do know their building um, is prairie, in prairie inspired. Um, so very well could, could have been influenced um, by Wright. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And that is a cool, that is a cool building. And uh, definitely, you know, they've got an art gallery there. Definitely want to go and take a look um, if you haven't yet. Um, to, here's two that are kind of, they kind of go together. Um, was it pronounced Nidekin or, or Nidekin? Nidekin. Folks were wondering, um, you know, where, where did he live and work? And did, did um, he build any of these wooden features on site at the Allen House? He was actually based in Chicago. And of course, that is where Wright was based for the early portions of his career. Um, he originally lived and worked in what's known as the Frank Lloyd Wright home and studio in Chicago. And he was there until um, about 1909. And that is when he um, abandoned his family and left with the spouse of a client and went overseas for a year. So things changed considerably from, from that point on. Um, but he had, he still worked in Chicago. Even when he returned from um, Europe, he lived in Wisconsin. He lived out in Spring Green where Taliesin is located. And he would take the train back into Chicago. And so he would work from offices mainly there until a little bit later in his career. And so he had a lot of contacts in Chicago and that's where um, he got a lot of the um, people who did that fine work on the house. You know, all of those details, the windows, the um, certainly the furniture. And I don't know that Nita can ever designed a home but again, um, he has a rich history and produced a lot of artwork, um, had art exhibits, things like that. And he is well worth a, a story all in himself. And um, the two murals that I know of that he painted in Frank Lloyd Wright houses 
is one in the Buffalo, New York, Darwin Martin House, and then the one in the Dana Thomas House, which is in Springfield, Illinois. And both of those homes are very much worth a trip if you're anywhere in the area. They're beautifully restored and um, to near original. And so they're, they're definitely very good um, examples of Frank Lloyd Wright's early and his prairie style work. Yeah, and um, I know we said a couple more, but that that occurs to me. Um, you know, before we we uh, before we started this, we talked a bit about the Price Tower in in Bartlesville, which is I think you could maybe maybe do that in a day trip. Are there mm -hmm. other um, in the you know within driving distance? What else could folks go to see in Frank Lloyd Wright that might they might be interested in? I would certainly recommend a trip to Kansas City. Um, there are two privately owned homes in Kansas City. One has recently been purchased at auction, and I think there's still some question as to whether or not that will be restored and um, available for tours. So there's the two private homes, and of course those are on the Missouri side. So Kansas has claim to fame to those two Frank Lloyd Wright houses, at, or houses and buildings that are here in Wichita. But then the, uh, there is the community church that is actually on Main Street on um, the plaza. And that is a significant later right design. It's um, a little unassuming from outside. When you get inside, it has some extremely rich and beautiful details. And one of the stories about it specifically is that Wright had designed a light tower, a spire of light to shine from the building. And first of all, um, that was the time of World War II and they couldn't have that kind of light shining in the sky. Um, but second of all, they couldn't, um, technology wise, they couldn't accomplish what he had envisioned. But eventually they did manage to recreate that in uh, I believe 1994. And so the church now has that light spire as Frank Lloyd Wright had originally intended for the church. And it is most definitely worth a stop. They are very used to people coming to see it. They'll offer you a self-guided tour. Um, and it, it's, it's a beautiful building, um, especially from inside. Cool, cool, yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I think um, unless you guys have anything else to add, I think we can uh, go ahead and, and uh, wrap up our program again. So appreciate it. Um, I've had a, a couple of people have asked, so I'll say, um, yes, this is, uh, this is being recorded and um, it'll be available shortly after we conclude the live stream. It should be popping up on the Newton Public Library Facebook page if you want to uh, go back to the beginning and watch, watch it again. And I'll also send a link to that um, out to the Zoom participants, um, probably get that done tomorrow. So um, again, thank you so much. And um, I encourage you all to check out the, Allen, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright Allen House website and Facebook page. And also the Newton Public Library Facebook page. If you give us a like, you can uh, find out about more events like this. Um, it's great to have you all. And I will go ahead and uh, sign off. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys.